Welcome to Linda's Corner. My name is Linda Bjork, and today we're going to be talking about how to find happiness and receive unconditional love. I'm delighted to welcome special guest Kelly Sparta. Kelly is a transformational shaman, professional speaker, the co-host of the podcast Spirit Sherpa, and the founder of the Sacred Power and Purpose Mystery School. She helps people stop surviving and start thriving by combining personal growth with energetic tools to create a holistic approach to personal evolution. You can reach Kelly at her website, kellysparta.com, and I'll include a link in the description. Welcome, Kelly. I'm so glad that you could join with me today. I'm excited to be here, Linda. I'm excited to be able to talk about all these things. I checked out your website. I read through some of the testimonials. I watched one of your educational um, training videos, and I, I'm just excited to learn from you today. So is it okay if we start with the concept that you mentioned of the wounded well? I loved that title because I yes. think it just applies to so many people. So can you explain what that is? Absolutely. I'm happy to talk about that. So uh, the wounded well is typically when, so, so I often tell people, look, a therapist makes you functional, a coach or a healer makes you happy, right? And so the wounded well are the people who have done the functional part of the work and are now looking for the happy part of the work. And I'm going to just add a slight tweak to that. As yeah. awesome as you are, I don't think you can make anybody happy, but I think you well, can no. provide That's the true. tools so that they can attain happiness. So, yes, that but is, I'm that is valid. I just it was easier to say it that way. Yes, you're totally right. <laughs> All right, so, fair enough. You fair can't enough. Make anybody happy who doesn't want to be happy. Let's just start with that. True story. Um, yeah, but uh, yes, it, 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 and in actuality, I mean, therapists and coaches and healers. I mean, we we're all just facilitators. Everybody does their own healing work. That is so true. Yeah. So, so the wounded well are people who have uh, done enough that they feel functional on a regular basis and they're good to go. Uh, so, you know, if they had trauma, then, then they've dealt with the active portion of that trauma and now they've just got the leftover trauma brain, right? Uh, and they're now looking at how do I thrive rather than just getting along, right? Right. And so, you know, a lot of that is about perspective shifting. A lot of it's about um, uh, changing your identity, and how you see yourself. And it's about learning different ways to be in the world. And then it's about, you know, uncovering the things that are, are the stories and the buttons and the triggers that send you flying and, and learning how to uninstall those. Ooh, right? Uninstall them. Okay, I love that. And you brought up the, the concept of identity. And that is one of the things that you talked about in your training that I would love to cover here. So what is identity and how do you know if you're struggling with your identity? Well, that's a great question. So identity is how we define ourselves, right? So it's uh, in, for most people, you define yourself by a variety of different roles, right? The average person, if you say, well, who are you? They'll say, oh, well, you know, I'm a wife and a mother and a, you know, and, and an entrepreneur and, you know, whatever else, right? And it, we, we define ourselves by roles. But we also define ourselves by uh, our, our stories and our beliefs about ourselves, right? And so, you know, if you are, if you're in a position where life has changed dramatically for you, you redefine yourself. And so for many years, I, I sold real estate back in the day, right? Years and years ago. And it was perfect for me because people were constantly redefining themselves because every time you move from one place to another, you are redefining yourself. It's now I live over here and I go to this doctor and I go to that dentist and I go to these restaurants. And these are the ways in which I define myself within my community. And I, I socialize in different places because I now live in this new place. And so every time you move, even if it's just a short move across town, if it changes how you interact, the stores you go to, the places you, you go to, that's a, 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 an identity shift. It's a very minor one in most cases, but, but it can be major. I mean, I moved from Boston to uh, Richmond, Virginia, and you want to talk an identity shift, right? It's like I went from being a Yankee to being a Southerner, right? Although the Southerners would probably claim I'm still a Yankee, but that's okay, <laughs> <clears throat> you know. And it became, you know, the, the expat, right? 
<laughs> it's almost like being in another country, I gotta tell you. So Crazy. but the the idea that you are someone else and we define ourselves both internally and externally, right? So we define ourselves against the roles that we serve for others, but we also define ourselves internally as as who we believe ourselves to be, right? Uh, and many of us have a story that, uh, you know, I'm not good enough or I'm too big or too much or, you know, I, I am unlovable or, you know, whatever, right? We have these internal stories that are, are defining us. Um, one of the most uh, specific identity shifts that I've been seeing a lot recently, because I've been working with a lot of business owners recently, is that when they're, when they're up-leveling their business, they're having to shift out of entrepreneur into business owner CEO. That's a huge identity shift because it changes everything about the way you, you perceive your business, right? And when you get married, huge identity shift. Now you're, now you're a spouse, not just a girlfriend or boyfriend, right? You know, now you're, you're connected. And so all of these things are identity shifts. We do them our whole lives, but, when you're doing it for as part of your personal evolution, the thing that happens is that your ego kicks in. And we have this, we see this sometimes. Like you'll see a, a, a bride or a groom get cold feet before the marriage, the wedding, right? That's the ego kicking in, going, can I really do this? I I I, I don't know that my single self wants to die. Right? <laughs> so is it a that, death of the old self? Like a, a morphing it, of a of a skin, a snake skin, so we can become something new. Exactly, it's called a shamanic death, and we we our old self dies so that the new self can take form, and so that's why you end up with these sort of <gasps> moments in big transitions. Well, when you mention it in ego. those words, that does sound scary, right? So yeah. I think a lot of times with our with our identity, and as you mentioned these different things, if you ask someone, who are you, the traditional thing that we come up with, again, is our roles and our profession. Right. But then I also like that you mentioned that internal talk. And I think a lot of us don't recognize that we have an internal identity. And sometimes it comes out in our self-talk where it's like, oh, why can't I do anything right? I, I am such a failure. I, I am such a loser. I am a this. I am a that. And they don't think that they're identifying themselves. It, it, it just, I just said that. I mean, I just said that. They don't realize that that is actually creating a, an identity. And it's, yeah. it's not good. It's not healthy. Well, and there's, there's another layer too, because I do energy scans, right? And so I'll go in and I'll look at somebody's identity as part of the energy scan process. And oftentimes what I find is that they've got this one identity that's in front of their real self. And so it's like they've got this mask that they're wearing for the world that says, I'm perfect. I've got uh, it all together. Everything's great. This is who I am. I want you to see this. Don't see the person back here. No, no, no. Don't pay attention to that. Just pay no attention to the man behind the curtain, right? Right. It's, I am the all-powerful Oz. Right? <laughs> That's what I was thinking of, too. Right. <laughs> and um, so, you know, it's it's that piece as well where, where they've got, and energetically, that's called a glamour. Right, where you are putting an energetic out in front of you that is so solid that people see that instead of seeing the real you. And you know, I had one up for many years. I didn't even know I had it up. Most people don't. Uh, and I, the way I found out that I had it is because I had my hair was down mid back twice. At, and I had my hair at mid back, and twice I got it cut like way short, and no one noticed. No one noticed. From no long knows. to Two short? weeks, and no one said a word. And I finally said, did you not notice that I got my hair cut? And they stared at me, and they stared at me, and they looked, and they went, oh, yeah, I guess you did. Wow. And okay, I so now I got to ask, did you wear it down, or did you wear it up so that, you no, know? No, I wore it down. Really? Yeah. Okay, that's, that's kind of crazy. Right? All right, yeah. so that was your the, clue that something, so something is see. going on. Yeah. Okay. So that's how I figured out I was wearing a glamour at the time. You know, this was 20 years ago, but yeah. So what did you find underneath when you pulled off that glamour, or at least discovered that there was an underneath? Well, you know, I, I always knew what was there, right? Because it's in my head, right? So we, we never, we lie to others about who we are, but we, we pretty much 
know who we are. We, we may pretend that we're not that person from time to time, which was my, my modus operandi, right? It was like, I got this. I'm good. I got it. I'm, I'm golden. No problem. I'll figure it out. Then inside my head's going, I don't know what I'm doing. I, 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 I don't I do <laughs> and, and, and the other part of me is going, it's fine. I'll figure it out. And I'm like, okay, okay, but I, I'm not so sure. <laughs> right. And a lot of times I think we think that people won't like us if they know who we really are, that okay. I, I am really a, a flawed character. I make mistakes. I, you know, I say stupid things. I do stupid things. So is that the kind of thing where, I mean, where, where we, where you say, I know inside that really I'm not all that, but I sure would like you to see all that. Is that what we're talking about? Or is there something different? Yeah. I mean, it's it, for me uh, and for many of my clients, it was, um, I need to be right. I need to look like I have it all together because that's how I have value to others. And Ooh. therefore that's how I'm like, that's how I'm likable and lovable. Right. Okay. So that is another one of the things that you touched on in your training that I really want to go there. And that is self-love yeah. and, and that explanation of what it is and what it isn't. Yes. So do you want to explain that one? Yeah. So uh, a lot of people think self-love is self-esteem and it's not. Um, you know, self, self-esteem is I, I am able to get out of bed. I can take care of myself. I'm capable and competent to run my life. If I have high self-esteem, I feel, I, I feel incredibly competent, right? And like, I, I know what's going on and I can manage. Self-love is I am lovable when I'm doing nothing. Okay. Right? Would you repeat that? Yeah. I am lovable when I'm doing nothing. I do not have to do anything to create someone else's love for me. Just being myself is sufficient to be loved. All right. And you mentioned that someone else to love you. And I think it's also yes. so that you love yourself. That too. So, but, but oftentimes we, we externalize that in expectation, right? We externalize that, that we, we look for someone else to love us, to give ourselves an excuse to love ourselves. And so, you know, I often couch it in those terms specifically so that people can, can understand that because, you know, all, all external love is a reflection of internal love to begin with. That's interesting. Okay. So let's, let's talk about, just elaborate on this thought a little bit, because I think it is so powerful. And it was that line that I actually had running through my mind for days after listening to your training, because it is so true and it encompasses such a huge array of ideas that, um, I mean, how many people uh, I have value because of my career, because of my, and these are the things that we use as our identity. I have value because I am a, a mother, for example. And then if your kids leave and you're an empty nester, all of a sudden your value is gone. Or I have value because I am in this particular job. But if you lose your job, then have you lost your value? Or I have value because, man, have you seen my to-do list? It is this long. And because I got all of these things done, that means I have value or their busyness. That's a huge yeah. one of yeah. I have value because look how busy I am. I mean, that, right. that means I have value. And the idea that I can have value when I'm doing nothing, it's, it's just intrinsic. It is, it is me. It is. It, and then what I do is, is, you know, frosting on the cake. It's, it's in addition to just the me-ness. And that is so huge. So how do you help people to get to that point where you can feel happy, safe, uh, valued just by being? Yeah, well, that's, that's a long, longer journey. Um, but there are some key points along the way, okay? And so, you know, the, the first step, if you... If you are somebody who has anxiety or worry or dread or self-doubt or, you know, you're struggling with inner and outer judgments, all of that, right? So, so like then, you're alive and breathing, basically, is what you're... Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> so, you know, the, the first step you have to do before you can do any other step is you have to find emotional safety. And the reason you have to do that is because if you are constantly spending all your time waiting for the other shoe to drop or waiting for something to be flying at your face and waiting for somebody to be angry at you, 
or you know, preparing for the things that are going to go wrong and having a plan and a backup plan and a backup plan for your backup plan because, ah, ah, ah right? Right. Uh, if you're spending all your time doing all of that, you have no bandwidth left to grow because growth requires leaving your comfort zone. And you're already so uncomfortable on a day-to-day basis that you're just like, uh-uh, I got nothing else. Uh-uh, we're not doing anything, right? Absolutely. And so the very first step in any growth process is to find emotional safety because that's what allows you the bandwidth to actually take the steps you need to take. So that's step one. And then step two is you have to solidify your sense of self, your identity, right? Because how can you love someone if you don't know who that person is? Right. And if you're not clear who you are, there's no way you can love yourself because you don't even know who you are. Right? And a lot of people are trying to please all these other people and they don't even know. Like that little scene, if you've seen Runaway Bride, where she sits and eats yeah. all the different eggs. It's like, well, what do I like? I mean, I thought I needed to like this because he liked it and I needed to like this because he liked it. I don't even know what I like. So that discovery process, that's huge. Yes. And so... Uh, within that, that process is the claiming of your space, right? So you have to, when you live a life as a chameleon or as a reflection of others, which is often the case when you don't know who you are, right? Then the the idea that you get to take up space in your own life is, is kind of alien, right? So that's the very first step is you got to learn how to claim your space. This is my space. I have a right to take it up. I have a right to define what it looks like. And I have a right to protect it if you decide to, to come into it and tell me it should be different. Okay, right? so let's it, it help me to understand space. I, I'm, I'm talking my physical being and the space that I take up. W- w- what are we talking about by claiming my space? It, it's everything about your life, right? It's a, I have a right to take up space in the room, take up space in a conversation, to have an opinion to uh, have a desire and a want of my own that isn't a reflection of somebody else's. I don't have to become smaller to make somebody else feel better. I don't have to apologize for my existence. I don't have to uh, uh, give way if somebody else needs more than I do. My needs are just as, as important as other people's needs. It's taking up space in your own life, right? Okay. And, and so that space, and then so the next step there is to set your boundaries and be like, okay, that's your space and this is my space. And, you know, I get to have this here and you get to have that there and I won't come into your space without your permission and you're not to come into mine without mine. And that alone, the saying of no <laughs> and the defining of boundaries is enough for a lot of people to go, <gasps> right? But then... When the person ignores it, because the first time you set a boundary, they're going to, right? Because they don't believe you because you've never had them before. You've trained them that they, that you don't have boundaries. And so therefore, when you set one, they're going to be like, ha ha ha, very funny, you know, and then they're going to wander across. And, but you need to be willing and able to say, Ahem, what part of the word no did you not understand? Ooh, that's huge. Right. You have to not only set your boundaries, but you have to be able to, re- to reinforce them, right? To, to be like, mm-mm, right? So that's step two. And then you have to own your power, right? Because own your power. if you enforce that boundary and they cross it again, you've got to be willing to stand in your power and be like, uh-uh, nope, this is mine. I, I'm not going to apologize for saying no to you. I'm not going to apologize for you violating my boundaries. That's not going to be okay. And that's a solidness in yourself. That's an ability to stand in your own power. This is not power over others. This is owning your power to be in control of yourself and to be able to make solid choices in your own experience. I love it. Yeah. Yeah. And so a lot of us are so angry that we won't give ourselves permission to have power because we're angry we're because so we haven't protected angry. ourselves. We're angry because we haven't protected ourselves. Yeah. Okay. We're so is this like because... a victim mentality type of a thing? It sounds um, different than that. It, it is, sounds like a powerless it, thing. Like everybody, I'm a paper bag. I, I'm blowing in the wind and I'm so angry because the wind keeps blowing and it's bothering me. Is it that kind of thing where I um, need to... It's, it's, think of it this way, right? Every time you don't speak up for yourself, 
every time somebody steps across your boundaries, every time you're treated as though you don't matter, every time you treat yourself as though you don't matter, every time you don't speak your needs, every time one of those things happen, you get angry because it, the anger is actually healthy. It says, I deserve better. Mm, okay. 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 So this is the thing when people are constantly talking about forgiveness, they're like, oh, you've got to forgive this person. You've got to forgive that person. I'm like, yes, after you get angry about it. And they're like, well, no, you have to forgive them. And I'm like, no, no, you have to get angry about it first. Because if you don't get angry about it, something in your mind will say, well, I must have deserved it because I didn't get angry about it. Mm, interesting. Right? So when we get, so the anger is actually a healthy response to not being taken care of right and so but it's there and we shove it down and we shove it down and we shove it down and then it eventually for, for most of us it explodes right um and so you know you get really pissed off about something and you you like go off about something to a degree that's completely unreasonable and it's a venting of all that anger right the other side of it is if you don't do that then you go inwards and you become depressed because depression is anger turned inwards Right. Okay. Um, at least so let's talk about anger a little complex. bit. Right now, there's there's a lot of anger, 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 anger oh, in huge. the world. Huge, huge anger. So um, I, I think we need to take it a next step to be able to say, how do we handle this anger in an appropriate and healthy manner? Because I, I mean, I see anger. Anybody who's driven down the road sees anger. I mean, what is we're talking about, we need to feel our feelings and not to deny them. That is so true. And it is so important. But also, there's a healthy way to do things and a not healthy way to do things. Yes. You don't take it out on the people around you. That's the key, right? Now, find yourself. I'm a big fan of a pool noodle and a bed. A pool noodle it's, and a bed. It makes a very satisfying thump. <laughs> so do you take your pool noodle? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Very satisfying thump. Yes. We all need some temper tantrums in an appropriate space. You know, without having to have somebody else. I'm a big fan of yelling and screaming while you do it, too. Okay. So, yeah. It's it's a... Or if you can't do it in your house because there's people in your house, then go into your car and just yell and scream in your car. Beat on your steering. Okay. I'm a big fan of that, too. Don't beat on the center of the steering wheel because you might activate the airbag. That would be bad. <laughs> but, you know, the, the, that would the be bad. part of the steering wheel is okay. <laughs> Generally. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. All right. That's excellent. Yeah, sticks and rocks, always good too. You know, you can beat on some rocks with sticks. That, that works in the woods. Okay. So, yeah. All right. But, you know, find a way to get it out. If you, you know, kickboxing class, boxing class, you know, a, a, a play in tennis. It needs to be something physical because anger is an adrenaline kicker and you need something to, to work off the adrenaline. Okay. So, so can you go for a walk and go for a jog and do that as well? Or do you like to punch stuff? I find that a walk is not sufficient. Running has a thud to it. There's something about the thudding, right? There's there, there's something physically about the thudding that allows the anger to move. It's, it's like a, it physically jars it loose sort of thing. So, uh, you know, hitting a tennis ball against the back backboard is fine because you got that whack to it, right? You know, kickboxing or whatever, it, it, just the, the, the thud of it. You know, you could you could probably do this and, and be okay, but there's a there's something about the the thudding that actually physically impacts the energy of the rage. Fascinating. Okay. Yeah. All right. So now we're we're claiming our space. We're feeling our feelings. We are allowing ourselves to do this. And let's see. Did we get beyond claiming our, our space? Setting our boundaries. Okay. So when somebody uh, our power. steps across our boundaries or or violates it in some way, so we are not supposed to be doormats. Oh no. We are to be doormat free and, yes. and it's time to claim our power and to be able to stand up for ourselves. And we are allowed to do that. Absolutely. Because we're, we're responsible worth it. to do that. Right. Ooh, I like that. We are responsible to do that. Because well, think about it this way. If, if I can't trust you to say no when we're doing things, then I can't trust you when you say yes. I can't trust you when you say yes. Is that because, because you'll say yes when you don't mean it. Okay. And then I will be crossing your boundaries. And it makes me responsible for making sure you're not crossing your own boundaries. If I want to make sure that you're not 
that you don't get hurt in the process. Okay, so a year. Uh, I'm, let me see if I can get my head around this. We're talking about two people interacting. La 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 la. Doormat and kind, considerate person who is trying to not hurt doormat. Right. Now, if you have jerk face and doormat, I mean that. Well, then jerk face, face is going to do whatever jerk face wants. Right, jerk face right. is very happy with a doormat the doormat situation. Okay, so we're talking about kind, considerate person who now yes. has an extra burden where I'm not sure that I believe you when you say yes, because you might not you mean it. No. That's where we're at. Okay. Okay. All right. I'm with you. You never say no, then I can't trust your yes, because I don't know that it's not a no that you're saying yes to because you don't feel like you can say no. Okay. All right. So it helps actually when a person creates their boundaries and, and yes. holds to them and establishes this, it helps relationships actually to be able to improve. It's yeah. not, a, a, you know, stay back. I've got my walls. Oh, it is that this is how we can have a healthy interaction because you know who you, where, who and where you are. And I know who and where I am and we can interact um, purposely and meaningfully. Yes. So, exactly. okay. All right. I like that. I actually had a friend of mine say to me, she said, you know, you are so clear in your communication and you are so on top of what you're feeling. She said, I never have to worry about whether or not you're unhappy and not saying something. She said, I always know that if you're happy and you're interacting with me in a good way, then we're good. I never have to question where I stand in our relationship because I know if you're unhappy, you're just going to come to me and say, this didn't work for me. Okay. Right. All right. And that's what good boundaries are. It's, it's not only speaking the boundary, but it's also about communication. Right. I appreciate you bringing that up because we're, as you're discussing this and, and for some people who are listening, it might be a new idea where, you know, I have permission to, to do this. I have permission to do this. Is this okay? What, what are the responses? What are the results going to be if I make this scary change? And here you're saying a specific example of someone saying, Oh, I love it. I love it. This is so easy to be able to get along with you and to be able to communicate with you because it's clear and it is above board and we're not playing games. We are peopling, you know, we're okay. All right. Yeah. Well, and I want to, I want to be clear though, because the person I was speaking to is somebody else who is also clear in her communication. Oh, that's nice. When, when you're shifting your communication style and you're dealing with people who are also not fully communicating and who are also conflict avoidant, which is uh-huh. why we don't set our boundaries is because we're conflict avoidant. The, the challenge with boundaries is that they are sometimes conflict, right? It's like, no, I don't want you to do that. That's conflict, right? It doesn't have to be heavy duty, hardcore conflict, but it is conflict. And, and the rule of thumb on this is speak early, speak often. Do not wait to set your boundary. Do not wait to speak if it got crossed. Do not wait to say something if you got upset. Because the longer you wait, the louder you'll be when you finally get around to doing it. And the more forceful it will be and the more and the less likely it will be well received. You know, if the moment you step on my toes, I go, ouch, that didn't work. And you go, oh, I'm sorry. Did I step on your toes? I was like, yeah, you kind of did. Oh, oh, okay. Can you tell me more about that? You know, oh yeah, I'd be happy to. This is this is what didn't work for me, and this is why, and this is you know, and and if you know your own stories, you can say, you know, oh, this kind of hit my button here, and I, you know, I'm I'm working on that button, but until I finish working on that button, could you kind of try and avoid that one for me if you can? You know, they're like, oh yeah, sure, you know, it's still my responsibility to deal with the button, but if you can, like, you know, step around it, that'd be nice, right? That way you're, you're making the other person aware of what happened. And then, you know, they have the opportunity to take, you know, respect that and take that into account in the future if they choose to. Mm. Not their job to, let me be clear, still your button. Not their job to navigate around your buttons. But letting them know is a kindness. Okay. Let's talk about buttons for a minute. Unless we're, are we still oh, yeah. working down buttons our path are, here? Well, or there's, is button there's, there's two more, two more pieces in the step and then, then we'll, we'll right. do the buttons. Okay. Perfect. So the, the next piece is internalize your sense of value, which is what we were talking about. Right. Um, and the, the piece there is about being able to understand what, how you value yourself. Right. Um, and so I often, uh, you know, 
one of the very first steps for both establishing self-love and for internalizing your sense of value is to turn your priority list upside down and put yourself on the top. Because for most of us, we're at the bottom of our own priority list. Wow. And I can hear everybody so going, true. but that's selfish. Uh-huh. Right? All and right. So... Going, no, that's selfish. <laughs> no, that's self-care. There's a difference. All right. Well, let's just distinguish between selfish and self-care. Because I have met, I mean, I'm sure as you have all different kinds of people, I have met selfish people. And I yes. have met people who are doormats. And I have met with people who are you know, self-care and have those beautiful boundaries. So as we try to distinguish what makes what, what's the difference between selfishness and self-care? Selfishness comes from a place of lack. It says, I'm going to get mine because it's, it's dog eat dog. And I'm going to get mine before everybody else gets theirs because I'm not going without somebody else. That's Ooh, selfish. Okay. Right. Self-care is I'm going to take care of me so that I'm so full up that I overflow with joy and, and happiness onto others about me. Well, that sounds like a good thing. And so right. as you give someone permission to do self-care and you give that kind of explanation, then a lot of people who are thinking, ah, will go, oh, okay, yeah. okay, okay. Well, and, and you can either give from your emptiness or you can give from your overflow. Which one do you think is more pleasant to receive? Mm. When we try to give from our empty, it, uh, it doesn't turn out very well a lot of times. We're, we're generally pretty cranky. Yeah. 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 I, I don't want somebody's emptiness. <laughs> and we're trying to avoid that. For sure. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's if you reverse your priority list, then... When you take care of your needs first, which of course requires being in tune with yourself enough to actually know what your needs are, which many of us don't when we start this work. Um, but once you've figured out what your needs are, when you take care of those first, then you're happy to take care of other people's needs because you're not walking around empty all the time. Right. Yeah. That's beautiful. Okay. And, so and the next step? Yeah, that's the first step for the, the internalizing your sense of value. And then learning to love yourself is about... So I, I want to say this. The average American child receives 437 negative messages a day to three positive messages a day. That's okay. not a very good ratio. That is a terrible ratio. Okay. And so what we need to do in order to start to love ourselves is we need to start to make up for that. We need to start saying nice things to ourselves. We need to compensate for all the negativity that we've received over the course of our lives by providing self-supporting language to ourselves. We need to shut down the monkey mind that is reinforcing all the abuse that we've ever received, right? And start reinforcing the positive side, okay? Because you don't speak to someone that you love in a way that is abusive. That is so true. And a lot of times we don't pay attention to the idea that the things that we say to ourselves in our self-talk, we would never say to our friends. In fact, we usually wouldn't even say it to our enemies, right. but we think that it's okay if we're saying it to ourselves. So that whole change of mindset. And a lot of times, I mean, there are positive affirmations, there are declarations, there are all kinds of things. And sometimes when you say those things like, you know, I am powerful, I am wonderful, it sounds like lies. Yeah. But I talked Not to a, a friend no. and he was so awesome. His starting point is, I am the kind of person who is kind to myself. And I okay. thought, ooh, I like that as an entry yeah. place. Let's start with that. So if that, oh, why can't I do anything right? No, I am the kind of person who is kind to myself. And, and to help stop that negative flow that just seems to come so naturally. Well, you know, we were, there is this, when you go into trauma brain, there is this thing that happens that the, everything is on high alert. You, we are hyper vigilant about absolutely everything. And any surprise is a bad surprise because we couldn't prepare for it, right? It's just like, what? What? And so if something doesn't happen exactly the way we want, it is all messed up. And right? because how many times do things happen exactly the way that we want? Like never. never. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The perfectionism that we chase is impossible to ever achieve yeah. because the world is constantly changing 
And perfectionism is a stillness state. It exists in absolute stillness and nothing can change. And therefore, it's impossible to achieve on this plane of existence. Uh. And so give it up. <laughs> give it up. Give yourself permission to be human. That's my my one big gift You're, to you. Please, please do okay. that. But um, well, yeah, let's go back to buttons, okay? Um, I, I love this conversation because it makes me, it, it just, it's, so the, the best way i found to describe buttons is this. If I look at you and I say, oh, you're purple. I can't believe how purple you are. It is disgusting how purple you are. How could you let yourself get to be so purple? What were you thinking? Okay. Now, some people who take, take responsibility for everything are going, oh, what did I do wrong? Right. But that wasn't about being purple. That's about I'm always wrong. Right. I'm, there's always something is my fault. Right. But most other people are looking at me going, girlfriend's got a problem <laughs> because I'm that not doesn't purple. make any sense. And what's wrong with purple? Right. It's, it's both. Right. So in order to have a button, you must both have something that says I am X and X is bad. Ooh, I okay. am X and X is bad. Right. Okay. And you have to understand that if somebody's upset you, it's because they pushed your button. They didn't do anything to you except say, hey, did you know you have a button there? Look at this button. This button really looks like it hurts here. You should know that this button is here. Poke, 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 poke. poke. That's all they're doing. You are doing everything else to yourself because you installed that button. Ah. And you can uninstall that button. And, and the that answer to uninstalling the button, yeah, is simply changing your belief about I am X or about X is bad. Okay. So you can either choose to believe that you are, so if you think you're, that you are purple and purple is bad, we'll take that as an example, right? Okay. Um, if you believe that to be true, then all you have to do is either say I'm not purple and have that be true. Or what's wrong with purple? Purple's fine. Okay. Either one, removing either one of them will no longer make it a button, right? Because people could look at me and go, you've got blue eyes. I'd be like, yeah, and? <laughs> blue eyes are horrible. <laughs> no, they're not, right? If you don't have a button that says it's bad, then it's not a problem, right? So, you know, it's it's one of those things where you have to recognize the buttons that are installed are yours. And if somebody else is hitting them, they're just showing you where they are. And it's just a, oh, oh, that hurts. Mm. Oh, yeah, I should do something about that. Right? Wow. If you could have that kind of response when someone pushes your buttons, that would be a magical transformation. Right. So, and the, the tricky part or the ouchy part is that that makes it my responsibility whether or not I respond to the button. Right. However, that also gives me the power. Yes, and that does. is a very important distinction because yes. I cannot prevent other people from saying things to me that maybe Correct. I don't like, and I can't prevent them from maybe doing something that I don't like, but I can choose my response. Yes. And I can choose how I feel about that and whether or not it makes me upset. So those are, are very powerful tools that you've shared with me, with us today. And I am so grateful for your time and your experience and your wisdom. So thank you for visiting with me today, Kelly. Oh, my pleasure, Linda. This was a lot of fun. Thank you. It's been a delight for me as well. In closing, I'd like to share a quote by Stephen Chbosky. He said, we accept the love we think we deserve. Today, I invite you to awaken to the truth that you deserve and are worthy of unconditional love, especially from yourself. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode of Linda's Corner, please share and subscribe to help us reach new listeners. I also invite you to check out my nonprofit, Hope for Healing, at the website hopeforhealingfoundation.org for free ebooks, free audiobooks, and other free resources to help increase happiness, build confidence and self esteem, strengthen relationships, manage stress, and calm feelings of depression and anxiety. I also invite you to grab a copy of one of my books, like Crushed A Journey Through Depression, or Amazon bestseller You Got This an action plan to calm fear, anxiety, worry, and stress. See you next time on Linda's Corner.